Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Well, uh, in this lecture, we would be looking at uh, some of the debates and controversy regarding sifting cultivation. I have been the, uh, partly mentioning about sifting cultivation time and again, uh, but uh, we have not really looked at the historical background and the kind of debate which involve among uh, academics, uh, policy makers. And there are different kinds of perspective, uh, maybe even within the disciplines of uh, social sciences, for instance, like the economists or ecologists or maybe the sociologists or anthropologists, they have different viewpoint depending on their kind of uh, research engagement. Therefore, it is important to look at uh, how sifting cultivation have been perceived uh, across different uh, point of time and it will be good to look at uh, uh, the historical background of how this controversy or debate in a way has arises. And one very important reason why we are looking at the theme of uh, sifting cultivation is because uh, mostly among the tribal communities, uh, it, it, it is partly the major or dominant uh, part of their natural resource management. So, policy makers or if not the ecologists and environmentalists have been always uh, questioning that uh, is sifting cultivation uh, the best form of sustainable resource management. So, keeping in mind uh, uh, these particular questions, we will try to look and uh, engage in delving upon the debates of sifting cultivation. Now, for instance, to begin with, if you look at the scenario of uh, Northeast India, uh, of course, uh, this sifting cultivation is being practiced across India and then uh, even if you look at the global scenario, mostly in Latin America and uh, South Asia and East Asia like Philippines, Vietnam so and so forth they have been practicing this for generations. Now, uh, the reason I am highlighting the context of Northeast because I am familiar with it and then uh, its communities have different names given uh, in the local context, but uh, in general parlance it is understood as zooming. Now, if you look at the uh, context of uh, Northeast, uh, and, and mostly the topographical and the geographical areas, uh, it, is, it is mostly uh, a valley which is being surrounded by the hills. So, the hill areas in a way make up uh, most of the uh, geographical landscape. And to the question is uh, to what extent the ecological or geographical landscape in a way paved way or uh, is suitable for the practice of these uh, forms of agriculture practices. Now, as we all know, Northeast in a way comprises of eight states and uh, namely Arunachal Pradesh, Assam, Manipur, Meghalaya, Mizoram, Nagaland, Sikkim and Tripura and uh, it uh, which has a total crop uh, of uh, 5.3 million hectares and a population of around 39 million. And uh, uh, at least 70 percent or to 80 percent are still predominantly dependent on agriculture. And when we talk about agriculture, it is not purely based on uh, zooming or shifting cultivation per se, but 
also there are people who practices the terrace or wet rice cultivation. So, we will also try to engage in looking at uh, the pros and cons of uh, practicing uh, sifting cultivation and uh, the wet rice cultivation. And, and to what extent uh, the kind of policy which is being uh, uh, espoused by the government is being effective or not. Now, again uh, this region normally I mean the, the eight states is again uh, dominated by the tribal population and uh, the development of agriculture and production of food grains in the region is highly depends upon the custom culture and the food habit of the local people. So, therefore, uh, sifting cultivation in this region is not necessarily uh, confined or uh, evolve around uh, the idea of this economic practices, but also a lot of custom culture and traditions are embedded and in the process it has become uh, not just an economic aspect, but a way of life for them. And the kind of challenges which is being witnessed in the past few decades is uh, as a result of the decreasing availability of land areas. Uh, it could be because of the process of urbanization, uh, the growth of population. So, the kind of space which is being required to practice these agriculture practices in a way is uh, still pretty much uh, in questions. Therefore, the challenges arise uh, not just uh, in terms of space, but also uh, the question of this uh, environmental sustainability is being raised. Now, uh, I am not going to uh, in, in this lecture, I am not going to delve into the uh, uh, in depth analysis of how this sifting cultivation is being practices or the kind of uh, socio-culture practices embedded in it, but for you to have uh, a general idea of to what extent people are dependent and in which particular region the sifting cultivation is pre predominantly practiced, so that you are familiar with it and then we move on to the uh, you know the what sifting cultivation is and the kind of debates which uh, revolve around these practices. Now, sifting cultivation is understood differently uh, in different regions across uh, the world. Now, uh, mostly as we as I pointed out in the northeast region it is um, uh, popularly known as juming and whereas, in the places like uh, Philippine, Vietnam and uh, Laos, Cambodia it is known as Sweden agriculture or Swedening or and also uh, it, it is it is known as slush and burnt and which perhaps uh, has been practiced by uh, these communities uh, mostly for more than a millennia and then the, uh, even the in, in many of the literature you would come across that these practices are being uh, done since time immemorial. So, uh, zooming in a way uh, in the context of northeast region is uh, you know a complex system with uh, wide variation that depends upon the kind of ecological variation in the area and culture diversity among various tribal communities. The reason being that uh, each and every communities have uh, not just followed the agriculture calendar, but so is the socio-culture practices which revolve around this agriculture calendar. And also uh, uh, maybe depending on their uh, topographical landscape, uh, they, they, they have no other option, but to practice this. Now, without much ado, uh, we will try to look at the concepts and meanings and methods which involve in sifting cultivation. Now, uh, how is sifting cultivation uh, being, uh, you know, practically being uh, done in the land. 
shifting cultivation in a way is a system in which uh, maybe a patch of forest or land is being uh, cleared and, and once those uh, dry branches and leaves uh, are, are usually being uh, burned uh, before the onset of the re rainy season that is the monsoon season. So, that uh, the site is being opened and uh, uh, for the release of the nutrients. Now, the use of this fire that is uh, the burning of those twigs and uh, leaves in a way uh, uh, enhance the uh, soiled nutrients and, and also it, it, it tends to you know uh, destroy the other unwanted wets at the same time uh, also uh, different kinds of insects which are perhaps considered to be a threat to those uh, uh, crops. Now, one of the reason why the primary thing which method which involve in this sifting cultivation is uh, burning. So, therefore, uh, ma many people uh, normally use the term called slush and burn that is uh, filling the you know vegetation and also engage in burning. Now, different communities have different uh, uh, knowledge of this use of fire and uh, from an outside this point of view usually the use of this fire is considered to be a threat and, and which eventually lead to you know extensive deforestation. But for those who practice uh, it, it, it enhances the you know the, uh, the soiled nutrients as a process of that. Now, this uh, clear fields or uh, once the vegetations are in a way being uh, burned, uh, it is it the you know with the with the onset of this monsoon, uh, you know it, it it allows to you know engage in uh, dibbling or uh, sowing of seeds, uh, and 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 once the monsoon comes, it it sort of uh, you know uh, germinates the seeds and. Uh, after the harvesting season, these areas often is left behind and uh, which, which, which is left to lie fallow uh, for a varying period that is normally uh, maybe 10 to 20 years and then depending on uh, the availability of land, uh, it, is, it is being left uh, so that a secondary forest is being uh, allowed to regrow. Now, uh, one very important thing which is being witnessed in the uh, recent trends is uh, with, with the change of you know the season seasonal changes like the expectation of monsoon so and so forth as we all know uh, to some extent because of the climatic changes. The adequate rainfall which is usually expected is normally uh, not coping up to the kind of uh, agriculture calendar which was normally followed. So, therefore, it poses some kind of a threat to those who practices uh, this agriculture uh, system. Now, they in a way have uh, you know tries to you know as, as we have discussed in the the human ecology and so on and so forth that perhaps human is you know the best to adapt or come up with a different kind of mechanism in any type of environment. Now, therefore, they have in a way switched to different forms of uh, you know uh, timing at the same time farming practices. Now, one of the reason why uh, these practices is being for those who are in favor of these practices uh, normally says that uh, it the, the, this this practices in a way allows uh, this agroforestry wherein a mixed cropping is being done at the same time it does not really hamper the uh, forest or trees. Now, in this 
uh, this agriculture is man main manage the system in a ways uh, that not only integrate uh, production uh, from the cultivated fields and also the diverse secondary forests, which also include uh, everything from grass and bushes in its early stages and also to the young open canopy trees to mature close canopy tree communities. So, in a way it, it give a space to you know uh, let the other tree grow. So, therefore, uh, this kind of practices to many of the ecologists and environmentalists appears to be uh, some sort of a kind of agroforestry. As, as it allows and gives space in uh, accommodating the trees to you know uh, grow. Now, uh, each and every successive stage like maybe right from the clearing or slashing down of those vegetations and then the process of this burning of, of those dry twigs and uh, leaves is followed by uh, uh, sowing of the seeds and also uh, the period of this uh, removing the weights or wading and then the harvesting. So, this sort of uh, period or cycle in a way is something which is pretty much visible in the context of these shifting cultivations. And now, what are the kind of uh, cropping system which is normally followed? It, it, it usually follows this uh, practices this mixed cropping and then the maybe different kinds of cereals, pulses, oil seeds and vegetables to in a way uh, suffice the needs of the family. And, and if you look at uh, uh, mostly in the uh, markets maybe in the cities and so and so forth, many of the vegetables which in a way uh, is available is uh, mostly from uh, those kinds of farming practices. Now, uh, one of the beauty or the uh, something which is uh, you know evident from this mixed cropping system is uh, the kind of strategy or uh, tactics behind this cropping system is when when you you know plant different kinds of crops. So, chances are there that some crops might fail, but whereas other might you know uh, grow and then prosper. So, therefore, uh, in, in this mixed cropping system even if uh, as a result of the climatic changes and the short supply of this monsoon rainfall, there are still possibilities that uh, it has the scope and chances of being uh, you know to go ahead with this kind of cultivation. So, so the crops normally which are grown here are simultaneously and harvested sequentially and uh, the slush and burn technique is normally you know adopted to cultivate the uh, Sweden lands and, and the beauty of this particular cultivation is uh, uh, no external nutrients are being used for cultivating the crops. So, which relies on the available soil nutrients of that uh, ecological space. So, therefore, what we call as organic farming or organic food, which is very much pretty much in demand in this present time is mostly uh, a product of this sort of type of cultivation. Now, uh, one of the major requirements uh, for any community uh, to be dependent on this zooming is uh, access to enough forested lands on the at their disposal uh, to that a Sweden follow the pet, uh, pet, uh, pattern to be established. Now, as I was saying uh, one of the main threats and challenges being encountered is how uh, the to get access to 
these forested lands. Now, uh, different kinds of forest policies are being enacted time and again and uh, many of these uh, policies are in a way restricting the use or access to this forested land uh, to many of those uh, <coughs> indigenous communities who are pretty much dependent on this kind of cultivations for millennia. Now, the question arises uh, if, if they are being you know restricted in using or having access to this forested land, uh, what, what are the available or possible alternative which the government in a way has you know uh, formulated. So, these are some very you know uh, pertinent questions which uh, allow us to look into the kind of uh, the politics if not the political ecology of these uh, agriculture practices. Now, if you look at the kind of uh, labor uh, which, which involve in this kind of cultivation, it, it, it compare with the uh, you know maybe the terrace or any kind of monocropping or any case crop plantation. This uh, sort of cultivations perhaps seems to be uh, much more labor intensive and uh, usually from an economic perspective it, 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 it tends to you know uh, is considered to be sort of unproductive and unremunerative uh, possibly when you are calculating the amount of labor which is being you know uh, employed and then the kind of production. So, therefore, uh, the input and output is usually uh, being measured and uh, many have come to the conclusion that uh, it is labor intensive and the return is low. So, therefore, it, it apparently it is uneconomical and, and uh, not really you know supported by this idea of the utilitarian if not you can say the commodification of resources. Now, even then uh, this zooming or uh, shifting cultivation happens to occupy a distinct place in the tribal economy and uh, constitute you know a vital part of the lifestyle and socioeconomic setup of hilled and uh, tribal regions and mostly uh, as I was talking about the northeast region. Now, uh, every state has uh, their own policies of you know controlling and then how this idea of uh, you know stopping these practices are being uh, initiated by the uh, forest department in every state, but uh, so far it appears that it, it seems to be unsuccessful in this and uh, this form of cultivation is you know regarded as a distinct stage in the evolution of agriculture. Uh, in fact, its origin is traced as far back as to the Neolithic period between the years 1300 to 3000 BC. So, uh, beginning from the Neolithic period, uh, this sort of cultivation has its uh, origin. Now, why is it that which, which has this existence for millennia in a way being increasingly posing a threat or uh, the sudden realizations of uh, these practices being seen to be a threat to the environment and uh, an economical. Now, for that to have uh, this answer, uh, we will come to the later part of discussion. Now, despite its ancient roots and uh, the kind of predominance among the hilt and tribal religion um, region, sorry. Shifting cultivation has been, you know, uh, a subject to uh, several criticism, primarily uh, from the perspective of uh, ecology or sustainability, because it is considered to be, you know, ecologically destructive uh, with a kind of mess it created or to the loss of this forested land. Now. Uh, as I said, it is it is not just confined to a single region, but across different parts of India. And uh, if you look at the 
uh, report of a UN study uh, in 1971 to 75. Uh, it observed that there was slightly less than 3 million people primarily or partially dependent on these modes of cultivation uh, and an estimate area of uh, which, which, which was practiced a year was less than 1 million hectares. Now, from uh, you know an economic wanted point of if you look at this the cultivation which is uh, you know sprawling an area of 1 million hectares and uh, which does not have much of a turn out is seen to be a waste and uh, which is often seen to be you know an evil practices by uh, many policy makers and also beginning from the colonial period. Now, how, are, how is this the opposition or ideas of uh, discontinuing this uh, zooming emerges? or the discourses within which uh, this idea emerges uh, is to be related back to the uh, historical period that is uh, very Elvin uh, an eminent anthropologist uh, and, and perhaps one of the best friend of uh, the late uh, Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru and who have been engaged in framing different uh, tribal you know uh, policies have been in a way instrumental in trying to look at the kind of uh, engagement of how tribals are in a way to be you know rehabilitated or if not uh, what kind of proce processes needs to be inculcated in terms of uh, bringing them in the mainstream. Of course, they do follow this idea of uh, isolationists, but then uh, one of the main uh, problems or principles uh, which guided uh, uh, as a result of this Elvin's initiative is that modern science in a way uh, should be you know able to you know help the tribal economy and uh, without destroying their uh, socio-cultural practices and, uh, and and of course the zooming practices. Now, perhaps this was the first kind of uh, you know steps which in a way contradicts to the uh, kind of practices these people has followed. Now, the question remains how could this uh, modern science fit in with a uh, local knowledge system that has been deeply entrenched in the artifact socio-cultural and tribal way of life. Now, in the previous lectures, I have been the, uh, talking at length about the, what indigenous knowledge is, what traditional ecological knowledge is and to what extent uh, this knowledge system uh, is part and parcel of the uh, indigenous people's way of life and we have also pointed out the differences between the scientific and the traditional knowledge and what are the discourses uh, 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 in the way in which uh, this knowledge system are being perceived. Now, uh, for quite some time the academics and uh, policy makers who are concerned with environment and the issue of this development tried to uh, combine arguments for improvement in the Jumiyas that is those who practice Jumiyas quality of life uh, with a concern for you know the quality of environment for sustainable growth. Now, uh, this research uh, aim at you know uh, informing uh, state policy and influencing the government action through development model. Now, the idea is uh, how does one perceive these practices by the development developmental model or the state led development uh, and, and then based on this you know perception or maybe let us say uh, with the kind of stereotypes they have against the tribals, 
they, they tends to frame certain kinds of policy and, uh, and, and try to impose rather than trying to unearth the kind of connectivity or the socio-cultural uh, backgrounds of those who practices. Now, uh, within this discourse as, as I am sure you are familiar with uh, uh, already familiar with the indigenous knowledge, traditional knowledge and will it be feasible to you know replace these practices or uh, what, what, what would be the possible outcome or consequences if one wants to replace these kind of practices. These are some questions which should in a way be you know taken into account. Now, the policy to create an alternative land use and the agrarian system and subsequently to the rehabilitation of Jumias has developed an anti Jum discourse that is uh, Juming is perceived to be you know uh, something which is and uh, as I said unremunerative practices or something which is seen to be evil in the context of environment and development growth debate. Now, one needs to uh, contextualize in, in that uh, environment and development growth, because that is perhaps the starting point where zooming has been you know widely criticized uh, from different uh, practitioners like the agronomists, the economist policy makers and even the geographers. Now, I would say this is this misconception or criticisms arises as uh, they are not really well versed with the, in the affinity or the kind of uh, attachment they share with these practices because one one tends to evaluate things from its you know uh, the external or the facial uh, perspective rather than trying to unearth the intrinsic or the uh, esoteric uh, uh, things which is pretty much embedded in it. Perhaps this is also because there is a little understanding of the complex system that uh, Joom supports that is the idea of this the Joom calendar that is the agriculture ca calendar the practice of the collective work and collective ownership uh, that is primarily based on community land that maintains the egalitarian structure of society and also as we had discussed the method which involves mixed cropping that diversified food grain choice and uh, most importantly the self sufficiency that is self sustenance. Now, this idea of uh, the social structure in a way is also having uh, a lot of uh, impact on uh, these practices. If you would recall uh, the idea of social ecology which was propounded by uh, Muria Bookchin talks about the environmental problems which needs to be located uh, within the context of the uh, social structure, the hierarchy which exists between or among different kinds of societies. So, it is this hierarchy which in a way has to be you know eliminated if the environmental problems has to be uh, you know solved. So, therefore, uh, they have these communities who practices uh, Joom cultivation in a way has uh, a collective ownership that is the lands are being community co communally owned and then uh, it is being cared and nurtured. Uh, by the collective. So, therefore, this idea of egalitarianism was pretty much prevalent in the social structure at the same time the kind of economic structure. So, because they do not have this idea of surplus if not owning an individual property. Now, therefore, the uh, idea of uh, producing uh, a surplus does not really arise. So, therefore, people are being much sufficient and they tend to 
uh, produce things which are adequate to them and which are self-sufficient uh, for their consumption or basic needs. Now, they are not being guided by this idea of uh, capitalist mode of production or any market oriented you know uh, production. Now, shifting cultivation has uh, been primarily based on what Marx consider as the ascetic mode of production, where there is the idea of the surplus and private property does not arise. Now, and uh, the whole economy in a way is based on self subsistence or subsistence economy. Now, therefore, this ascetic mode of production which is inherent in the uh, shifting cultivation is again antithetical to the uh, market if not the capitalist mode of production. Now, who are the ones you know propagating or trying to push this sort of uh, profit oriented if not capitalist mode of production? It is normally being uh, pushed forward by the state. Now, we will also come to the historicity of how uh, these shifting cultivators or jumias or what James is called as term as jumias are in a way a state evading people, because uh, in this kind of practices uh, since the government in a way considered it to be a waste and there is no turnout since there is no surplus, uh, it, it is sort of a loss to the you know state because it does not uh, uh, kind of produce any uh, revenue, because the source of revenue is absent in this kind of practices. Now, uh, what are the kind of uh, colonial perception towards these practices, because uh, many of uh, policies which are being enshrined may be uh, it may be the forest policies, it may be the kind of conservation, preservation and so forth is again something which is being borrowed from the our colonial masters. And India has been as we all know uh, for more than 200 years uh, being colonized and, and, and uh, apparently this idea of colonial hangover is still very much embedded and then seen in the kind of uh, how our policies are being framed. Now, if you look at the history that as early as 1883, uh, Baden Powell, the British policy maker uh, ha has in a way strongly you know advocate the absolution or absolution of this Jum uh, in this manner and he made a remark that the fact is that this cultivation that is zooming is so wasteful that somehow or the other it must be put to a stop just like city or any great evil. Now, it is seen to be evil perhaps because of uh, the uh, output because it does not have really you know uh, anything to enhance the state revenue and uh, it is seen to be you know uh, unproductive from the perspective of the civilizational uh, point of view that is the colonial perspective. Now, this observation had uh, you know a wider impact on the you know colonial policy towards the treatment of the Jumias or the Jumland and the perceptions of of the state towards such agriculture economy uh, was vindicated. Now, this perception or I would say the stereotype typical of stereotyping of these practices in a way has guided the state late uh, policies uh, since then. Now, similarly in the notice region the land revenue department could not make a great deal of revenue from the prevalence of June. Now, this was because the upland areas under colonial domination were subjected to a house tax rather than a land revenue assessment. Now, uh, 
if you tends to you know uh, look at the literature mostly among the tribal communities in the northeast region, you will come across that many of them you know simply pay house tax and then they do not pay uh, land revenue, because many of the uh, upland areas are still not being surveyed by the state and then it does not come under the clause of the uh, land revenue department. Therefore, it, it in a way is considered to be a loss to the state uh, if this kind of uh, agriculture practices continue. So, this sort of idea has evolved and then being pretty much uh, influenced by the colonial perception towards uh, zooming practices. Now, as I had said, uh, if, if once, once try to look at uh, the forest policies, I, I would still say that it is uh, a continuation of the colonial legacy. Why? Because uh, the, this official policy of the British Raj was in a way carried forward even after uh, you know almost 70 years uh, after independence by the Indian state without taking into account the relevance of Zoom in the hill economy of the tribal communities. Uh, perhaps because they tend to you know overlook the kind of uh, factors which played around or which is embedded in these agriculture practices. Because as I said it should not be you know uh, seen from a narrow or isolated uh, practices of in terms of the economy or agriculture rather, but one needs to you know uh, take into account the kind of uh, other factors which are also inherent in these practices like the, uh, the socio-cultural factors, the attachment with the land and how it is being you know uh, a question of uh, survival and identity of the people concerning uh, in, in, in that region. Now, the government after you know, independence uh, tends to come up with various five years plans and also primarily Im embark on a policy to you know uh, commercialize Indian agriculture that would whether all forms of this self subsistence farming uh, which also include uh, the zooming practices. Now, why is the state moving towards you know commercializing uh, the resources rather? Is because uh, by and by we tends to you know you know mimic and then ape the the European or the the colonial the colonialist mindset or policies in terms of you know uh, raising the state GDP or so and so forth. So, perhaps all this in a way influence the state policies. Now, the ecologists and demographers uh, on the other hand have developed an anti zoom discourse as a result of this and on the presupposition that uh, as a result of the short zoom cycle, it has led to you know uh, uh, a loss of this sustainable agriculture in the hills. Now, uh, this idea or the debate of sustainability comes into question as a result of the recent trends of the loss of vegetations, forested land, so on and so forth. Now, therefore, one needs to look at the social and economic history of these uh, who practices, because we cannot afford to you know uh, evaluate or comes to a conclusion by merely observing the present trends. And, and perhaps there could be other factors not just primarily uh, zooming cultivation. Now, one tends to overlook the kind of uh, the timber extraction or maybe any other kind of let us say mining and so on and so forth. And perhaps the blame always goes to those uh, the marginalized or those indigenous communities. So, therefore, uh, one needs to look at the 
political ecology of how one stands to perceive this shifting cultivation. Now, uh, many of these ecologists or demographers or the state policy makers, you know, tend to blame the uh, these communities who practice this zooming by branding them or uh, labeling them as uh, a primitive practice or, or making uh, putting them in a very disadvantaged and vulnerable position to even survive. Now, sometime uh, from a civilizational discourse which is being proposited by the uh, uh, British colonialists and then at the same time uh, carried forward by the state. Uh, as if these communities who practices uh, zooming needs sort of uh, rehabilitation and then because they need to be mainstream and uh, they should engage in a civilized agriculture practices, which in a way uh, is something uh, which has not just uh, marginalized them, but also uh, the question of survival or their identity is being a threat as a result of all these assumptions and then the perception from the state. Now, from the government or the state perspective, the issue of this shifting cultivation is also related to forestry and forest management. Now, forest policies in most of the developing or third world countries uh, are in a way uh, they closely followed those they had under the colonial rules and India is not exception to this as I pointed out. Now, therefore, one needs to you know reframe and restructure. Now, if you remember uh, in, 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 in the you know previous lectures when I was talking about how these ecological problems or the environmental problems are to be addressed and located, because one needs to also look at the kind of the human nature relationship which is uh, prevalent in the developed countries and in the underdeveloped or third world countries. Now, mostly uh, Ramchandra Guha in a way uh, tends to you know divide these as the north and south divide, because uh, the protections or conservation of uh, environment uh, to the north and to the southern countries is different, because ecology to the south is a matter of you know their survival and subsistence, rather uh, to the northern developed countries it is a question of protecting the environment uh, for their own health and also altogether there is a different perception uh, which revolves around the psyche of the affluent communities. Now, in recent years this environmental cost has raised important questions on the government policy outcome. Now, along with this uh, you know the demographers in a way maintains that the rise in population has caused a further misery and uncertainty, uncertainty to many indigenous natives living close to nature. So, even then uh, they, they tend to overlook the kind of connections and attachments uh, that uh, these societies or communities share that harmonious relationship with nature. Uh, it, 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 it ten, they tend to perceive uh, from the you know uh, the productive if not the output usually from these practices. So, therefore, one needs to question uh, the kind of perceptions with the state or the state follows what kind of uh, ideas the, this perhaps needs to be in a way deconstructed. Now, if you look at the work of this uh, Madhav Gadjild and Rams and the Guha, they uh, elaborate that uh, the shortage of land for the Sweden agriculture or maybe a prey for hunters and grazing for pastoralists as a result of degradation in forest. 
Now, control over this scarce resources also in a way uh, generate certain kinds of conflicts among different uh, groups and communities or uh, maybe people like uh, inhabiting different kinds of geographical space. For example, uh, most of Northeast India and the Chittagong hill tracks in Bangladesh are in a way uh, militarized. Now, a detailed account of the situations in this area shows that it is not just a question of maintaining law and order, but also of land and forest which remain central to the economy of the region and identity of its population. Now, uh, if you browse uh, through the net, I have written a piece of paper on the, the how the indigenous community perceive the idea of development through uh, dam. And uh, I give a title called the enclosures of colonization, indigeneity uh, and uh, development. Now, in that I argue that many of the state uh, mostly uh, because my study is confined in Manipur. So, I give a critical look at how the develop state led development agendas by you know building a dam is being pushed forward. Now, if you look at the geographical space of Manipur 90 percent of the state is hill areas which are dominated by the tribal communities and 10 percent or less than 10 percent is the valley which is mostly dominated by the non tribals. So, in that if you look at uh, many of the dams like maybe the Mapit Hill Dam which I was uh, conducting a field work, it appears that the state wants to you know push forward that kind of development practices. So, that in the periphery those communities are you know being uh, displaced and those area are being controlled by the state and this sort of uh, forceful intrusion or displacement is again being initiated under the you know uh, 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 image of this uh, maintaining law and order because as I said uh, you know the idea of this militarization and I am sure you all are familiar with uh, the OPSPA that is the Armed Forces Special Power Act which is pretty much in the dep uh, deployed in northeast region of India and then uh, parts of part of Kashmir. So, in order to maintain this law and order and under this uh, particular you know policy, the state in a way tends to use misuse their power and then intrude or tries to colonize the indigenous people's land by pushing forward the, the state development agendas like building a dam. Now, therefore, one also needs to look at uh, the politics behind of how the indigenous peoples are land, uh, indigenous people land are being you know uh, put within the framework of the state. And therefore, one needs to look at the history and then the De depending on the kind of region you talk about maybe the Chittagong hill tracks and uh, other areas. The history in a way has witnessed this kind of contestations and struggles between the tribals and non-tribals over the control of land and forest. Now, again let me add one particular point in the context of Manipur that uh, in 2004 they have come up with uh, a new land use policy which is in a way uh, you know ado adopted from the state of Mizoram. Now, in this new land use policy, uh, it has been uh, you know uh, pointed out that the zooming practice or shifting cultivation is a wasteful practice. So, the state government should come up with uh, you know a new land use policy by surveying or putting all those uh, land under the revenue department and they should monitor in such a way that the people who are being I mean the practicing shifting cultivation 
uh, should be stopped and an alternative ways uh, of uh, means of livelihood should be you know inculcated. Now, the problem arises here that in the state of Mizoram like like majority of them are tribal. So, it is not much of a problem to them, but in the context of Manipur like majority of them are non-tribals who are confined in the valley and the hill areas. So, since the uh, land revenue and uh, land records are not uh, prevalent in the hill areas. So, to push forward this new land use policy is something which also have you know uh, uh, a politics behind again you know intruding or colonizing the indigenous people's uh, habitat areas or forest land. Now, therefore, one needs to you know locate and tries to understand the you know politics behind how these policies are being pushed forward and uh, to what extent the state is being guided by this idea of a sincere rehabilitation uh, alternatives to uh, these communities. Now, again the, from the works of uh, Guha and Gadjil, uh, this the forest policy of the government of India, which has continued with the colonial legacy and how this has directly affected the Rian tribe in Tripura. I have given this in the reference, uh, maybe you can have a further understanding of how uh, the implication of shifting cultivation and uh, uh, the Tripura state policies is being uh, witnessed uh, or in the context of the Rian tribe, how the state is trying to put forward the you know alternatives or the feasibility of you know, you know trying to push forward the, st uh, the forest policy of the government of India by restricting or limiting the access and use of the forest land. Now, the colonial rulers were in a way you know guided by this idea of you know generating revenue from the agriculture expansion and this was the sole reason for economic exploitation of the forest area in the subcontinent. Again, uh, if you look back at the you know the history of the tea plantations or the coffee plantation uh, which is uh, predominant in the valley of uh, Assam if you look at these are some of the initiative which are being taken by the colonialist because they, they, they are in a way able to generate much more revenue to the state rather than these practices of or the wasteful practices of zooming cultivation. Now, these are something which the environmental historian all are also arguing about that how the these colonial rulers in a way have initiated the kind of uh, agriculture practices, the kind of plantation or the kind of forest policies which they have uh, you know uh, initiated where you know uh, carry it forward you know to satisfy their you know economic needs or rather the you know generating of this revenue. 